If you have been struggling to lose weight and keep it off, then today's podcast episode is for you. Today, I'm welcoming my friend, Lindsay Howes, on the podcast. Lindsay is an author, dietitian, and personal trainer with a strong focus in accountability coaching. Lindsay is incredibly passionate about rewiring the rules of what success should feel like in the health and fitness world. She believes that we have to leave the all or nothing mentality behind and celebrate small daily efforts. Lindsay believes that it's the small changes that will provide the ultimate success to what we are seeking. Lindsay is the podcast host of Direction Not Perfection and believes that change is in the showing up and that we should all be thriving throughout our days, not just surviving. In this podcast episode, Lindsay and I discuss how to turn away from that inflammatory diet culture mentality, what are some of the real health success metrics that we should be paying attention to and monitoring, some of the pitfalls that Lindsay and I have both experienced when we've embraced black and white thinking, and what is the secret sauce to successfully losing weight and maintaining weight loss in the long term. I hope you will enjoy this awesome episode with Lindsay House. Well, thanks for joining me today, Lindsay House. I'm super excited to have you on the podcast and talk all things about nutrition, accountability, and diet mentality. I'm so excited to be here, Sherry. Thank you so much for having me. I feel honored. Well, let's get started. I love the topic that you really like to talk about on your podcast and when you're guests on people's podcast and kind of what you're all about is turning away from this diet mentality. I think so many of us have grown up in the 80s, 90s around the diet mentality and the cover of magazines and thinking a size two is perfect health. And I'd like you to dive into that. And what are your thoughts about turning away from this diet mentality? Am I, and am I even explaining it the way you think of diet mentality? Um, yes, absolutely. And I think the easiest way to segue into this is more with a story, because then I think your listeners will go, I've been there. I've done that. And this all stemmed back from I was working an outpatient job as a dietitian, and I would have to go pick up my client, my patient, out of the waiting room. And so we'd have this little bit of a walk where we would chit chat about how'd your week go, you know, and there was this excitement of I walked more or I did my meal logging or just exciting things. I got on the ground and played with my grandkids and I noticed when I stood up, my knees didn't hurt. So there was this wonderful flow of conversation for the most part, not always. But then once I put that patient on the scale, that if the number wasn't exactly what they were hoping for, I would lose them. We went from smiley and proud of results to they weren't with me anymore. They were disappointed. And sometimes I found myself back at my desk, like flipping through the chart. What did, oh, did they gain? Blah, blah. And sometimes they didn't even gain. Sometimes they just maintained. It just wasn't the number that they were expecting. And it took an entire hour session to, to like come back from the scale talk about all the positive things where they were then back in a good mental spot to talk about forward actionable steps. And that just was incredibly frustrating to me because one, I felt for them, like my heart hurts for somebody when they can discredit all of that beautiful work in one moment because a scale was giving them their, their ability to be joyful for the day or not. And I think that's what I'm bringing up. If any of your listeners are going, <clears throat> that is me. I've stepped on the scale in the, on the, in the morning and noticed, you know, for the rest of the day, I'm irritable. I, my family doesn't get me how they want to get me because I'm not, I'm not showing up because I'm, it's already ruined my day. And I feel like at that point, I was just like, I'm, I'm a little over people using this as a measurement of success. So I did go far spectrum of scale smashing because it just felt good for my clients as well as something to visually show like this doesn't have to be it. I know but, I saw that picture on your website. I loved it. Yes. Yes. I have a little 60 second clip that I can throw your way for the show notes, but it's kind of for anybody who's just in that mental space and needs to see those numbers fly. Agreed. And I find that in some of my clients that I work with as well, the scale, it like, 
is their worth for the day. You know, it, it's their badge of did I do good or did I not do good? And that's not even a true marker of health. You know, there are other markers that will tell you so much more about the quality of your health than a scale will, right? Because a scale, you know, whatever the number shows, let's just pick one out of thin air. Let's just say 145. Do we know that um, that's a healthy fat mass composition? Do we know that that's a healthy uh, skeletal muscle mass, right? It, we don't know. You know, um, we don't know if they're just retaining water or if they're actually dehydrated and that number's too low because, you know, they're without enough water. So we just don't even understand, you know, that number. And it's amazing how much we interpret that to mean we're good or bad or we're on track or off track when I just think there's so many other metrics that can tell us so much more and I think would be even better markers to monitor than just the pure weight. Not saying we have to throw out the weight or throw out the scale, but it's just not something that I want telling me how I should feel that day, right? Uh, and um, take over my mental space and my emotional health, as you said. What are some metrics that you find would be more helpful or that you work with and your clients begin to measure or monitor? So I have had the absolute privilege of sitting next to therapists in office spaces. And I, I have a favorite and she developed, it's called a scale of success survey that I have adopted. And it's about 52 questions. And it goes through everything from like sleep patterns to energy, mood, irritability. And, and it's this way because I think all of these markers that you and I are talking about they're ambiguous, right? It's very hard to nail them down and say, I've really improved. I've noticed a 1% increase in my energy. You know, things normally have to be a lot more drastic than that for us to give ourselves credit for it. And so something like this survey, I like to have clients take it kind of right out of the chute of working together. So we have this baseline and it goes anywhere from like, I never feel this way, rarely, to I always feel this way. And I think what's interesting about it is we take it and then two months later, or sometimes even just six weeks, depending if that client needs more like of a visual, but they'll go, huh, that's interesting. I didn't even really realize I was lacking on the social end until now I see myself answer this question differently. Or I didn't realize that I wasn't sleeping very well, but now I'm saying I'm sleeping amazing. So it just builds that insight that I think most of us are too busy to sit down and really think about and and to assess, to give ourselves credit for those very small wins, which I know you talk about as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I like that you are, it's more holistic, it's more comprehensive. It's not just this number on the scale, which is kind of arbitrary as we just discussed, but mm -hmm. other markers of health, right? We know if you don't get enough quality sleep, Right, that can affect so much, including your weight. And I don't know if people are always linking sleep quality with, you know, optimal health in terms of even maintaining or losing weight and that ability, right? Mm -hmm. Because we know, you know, our cortisol and so many other hormones are off whack if we don't get proper sleep. And so I love having all those metrics, right? Really taking that holistic approach and helping the client see it from just a broader perspective of gravitational pull. <laughs> on this device? Well, I feel that if we don't have some of that to come back to that is a little bit more tangible, it's lame mental foundational work with weight loss, as you know, that people get frustrated because the pounds aren't falling off quick enough. Like they lose their momentum in the journey if they can't see success. And so if there's nothing to point them back to, because there's so many times where they're going, yeah, but yeah, but I, I didn't see that scale move. It's like, honestly, you might not for a bit until if there's a lot of mental work to do, then that might take months to even years before all of a sudden that foundation is laid. And now, now the ripple of weight loss comes with it. But how hard to stay on that journey if we're expecting only weight loss to be our medical marker? And it was interesting that, and you mentioned sleep, 
I had a guest one time say that sleep is the Swiss army knife of hell. It affects everything, you know, and that's exactly what you pointed out. And it does. So if we're missing all these other elements, then we're missing the big picture of health, of what's going to give us longevity. That's a great analogy, the Swiss army knife. You know, you said something there that I really want to highlight for the audience and the listeners. You know, sometimes you want weight loss. And you had mentioned, but maybe there's things getting in the way for that person mentally, right? And I love how you pointed that out because we know that we don't walk around as two separate units. There's a head over there and a body over there. We know that they are connected. (laughs) And so I think a lot of people don't see how their own head gets in the way of their body doing what it is designed naturally to do, meaning stay in homeostasis, meaning balanced hormones, meaning the body knows how to heal, right? You cut yourself, it's going to, you know, coagulate, stop the bleeding, and it's going to scar, the scar is going to peel off, and then you're back to wholeness. So I think there's so much innate wisdom in the body, but we're just using our head too much or in a way that doesn't serve the body to make it feel safe to lose weight, to balance the hormones. Maybe we have a trauma that needs to be dealt with. Maybe there's some limiting beliefs getting in the way that we can actually embody a body that feels good and can function well for us. I just love how you talked about that, about, you know, really maybe there's some mental work to do before the actual weight loss starts to happen. And I love. I just had to highlight that for the audience so that they heard that message. No, I appreciate that. And I'm going to piggyback on it for a moment because you mentioned limiting beliefs. And I think it's really important to point this out. A lot of us have this limiting belief, and you mentioned separating kind of body and and mind, that if we accept our body and we're actually like living in homeostasis with we accept it we love it then we don't believe that we're still fighting for goals we believe that it's one or the other if we settle and we're happy then we are just saying we don't care if we ever lose the weight we don't care if we ever get as healthy as we're going to get we've just settled when it's that's false there is this actual it's a dichotomy of i can love myself and i can also want to change And I think that's important for people to hear because they don't believe that necessarily. And you might not even believe me while I'm saying it out loud today, but you can love yourself and you can still want to change all in the same day, all in the same breath. Yeah. But and I I love that in highlighting that self-compassion, because just with my history of hating myself because of how much I drank and Mm -hmm. trying to white knuckle, not drinking, I'm not going to do it. And then I would, you know, be successful. And my definition of success was absolutely zero drinks, right? There was no drinking less. That's not good enough, right? 50% reduction, that doesn't mean anything. It has to be perfect. So if I met all 30 days without a sip of alcohol, then I can, quote, give myself the pat on the back and badge Mm -hmm. of honor and all that. And it wasn't until I was, like you said, dropped into that self-compassion piece and said, okay, my drink count was whatever, 37 for the week. I'm going to love myself because I'm still alive. I didn't hurt anybody. And I know it's a pattern I want to change. And I'm going to love myself through the journey because I'm going to learn so much more about myself. And it's going to be easier as I learn that self-acceptance piece and that self-compassion piece. And it didn't make me want to stagnate and stay at that same drink count. It actually, when you start loving yourself or start having compassion for yourself, it's like, oh, Yes, I could still do these behaviors and still want to get better. And that could be by that small incremental change. So I love your take on the binary thinking of the brain because my brain is always in that black, white, perfect, not perfect, right? There's no like gray area. And once I allowed more gray area to come in, in in these pieces where I wasn't allowing gray area and dropping into more of that compassion, I realized that change was not only possible, but it would happen a bit quicker and not backslide, Mm. right? Not backslide. Mm -hmm. Because then you're in that hate cycle that makes you want to drink more or eat more or eat the wrong things. And then, you know, you're just 
bouncing back and forth to I need bliss with the food or the drink to I hate myself without it. Yes. Yes. This is why I've loved you for so long. I've literally binged on your episodes for years now. And one of the first pieces that caught my eye and my ear was the everything you're talking about with your journey of drinking, you can easily flop over to somebody's journey with eating and, and the black and white thinking and that I mean, they're really good or I'm off. And so and I'm sure all of your listeners just did that. Like, I can see myself doing that with food. I can see myself doing that with exercise. So all these topics overlap. And I love how you also always approach drinking with it's even if it's negative for us, it's serving us somewhere. And and that's the same thing with food and fitness or lack of fitness. You know, it's something serving us. So we have to love ourselves into the next change so that we can actually want to do it. Because if we don't like something, why would we ever want to stick with it? I've seen so many people with like workouts keep beating down that door of I'm going to sign up for a race. I'm going to sign up for a marathon. But they love Zumba. They love to dance or something. And I'm like, do what you love. Quit worrying if everybody else is doing the other thing. Yeah. We've got to like love our food and our and our fitness. Yeah. And so some pre- some people, our knees give out or our hips give out. Like running is not the sport that you, many people can take up for life. <laughs> you know, so um, it, it doesn't mean that you can't enjoy exercise in another way or you can't learn to enjoy movement in a different way if that is a way that's not benefiting your body. And just like you said, it comes back to listening to our body because our bodies will tell us, yes, not these knees anymore, Sherry. Like my <laughs> knees have told me. It's it's great you like running and you love the yeah. runner's high, but it's just not for us anymore. You know, maybe in small spurts, but we're not doing the marathons anymore. So I just want to honor that because I want to honor my natural knees as long as I can. Yeah. But I think yeah. all this fits in the turning away from diet mentality talk, because for some of us, if that's the door we've been beating down, because that's where we saw results earlier on in life. And so now we feel like to get to those same results, we need to eat that certain way or we need to exercise that certain way. That we really do have to like step back and turn away from all of that old thinking as 40, 50 year old, 60 year old self yes. to make sure that we're functioning the best that we can through our season of life. Right. Exactly. And I was talking about this inside of um, the Epic U community. You know, sometimes I look at people who aren't the stereotype my brain expects to see in maybe a beautiful put together outfit or a bathing suit that they're rocking. And maybe they don't have that, quote, perfect body that my brain says. And maybe they're older. And then I just see them owning it and being confident in it, no matter their size, no matter their age. And I'm like, I want that. So I think there's so much more than just the image in our mind that we think is going to bring us happiness. Because then when I see other people exude happiness, confidence, not going all the way to body positivity where, you know, you know, not working towards health. Right. Just got to say there's a fine line there. But just seeing like people own who they are and have that joy from within you can like see that a mile away you can like sense that and i think that is way more attractive than the person who looks like they haven't eaten in months and sometimes they don't even look happy spot on that's what i was going to say how many times have we seen somebody get to that goal weight and their life hasn't changed the job hasn't changed the friendships haven't changed you know and i have clients who even say that i've been there i've seen that i know that that actually isn't the end-all be-all. And and that stinks because that's really hard work to get to that. And if we think there's this like aha moment of everything's going to change now and it doesn't, back to the mental work, which takes time, which is a little more boring, you know, yeah. but way more worthwhile. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's not like you can live in a state of bliss always. So I just caution people who think that number on the scale means so much more than what you actually are going to experience, right? It's not pure bliss all the time. Yeah. You know, when people say, but I've been working on this issue or problem or my weight or my drinking or insert whatever in that blank, I've been working on this for so long. You know, I wonder if I should just 
throw in the towel or give up or why is this so hard for me? What are some of the things that you think are going on for that person that they need to hear? This is like my favorite question because I think this is everyone, right? Anyone who's been battling a health journey for as long as they've been battling, some people since, you know, before the teenage years even, there becomes this disbelief of I'll ever actually get to where I want to go. And I think one of the coolest parts about really being coached through a journey, and I know you do this with your individuals as well, you've seen them get to that point where they're like, oh my gosh, I'm a different person, right? And they got to be a different person in their journey because they took a different route. If we change nothing, nothing will change. And so when we think about We'll say I've never, well, I'm going to use the person who's never been a worker outer. They, they're they like, I have never liked it. I have been a bookworm, a couch potato. You can throw any of those terms at me and I can relate. And you want me to get out and work out every day to be healthy? No way. So the the problem is not that they're not capable of working out. It's that they've had the shoulds of how to work out for so long that they kind of forgot that they had a choice in the matter or they kind of forgot what they even liked in the first place. And we can transfer this over into all of our other categories too with food and whatnot. But this is the work that has to be done within the journey. And I call it fitness personalities or nutrition personalities. It's really diving in and discovering like, what did you used to like? And if you've never found something activity-wise that you've liked, what could we start trying now? And we might need to try 20 things before the one thing kicks in and goes, this is it. I like it. For whatever reason, this is my thing. But I I don't believe that individuals give themselves long enough on the journey or give themselves enough credit that they, in fact, already have the answer built within them. Not that somebody from a diet program is going to hand them the answer because I still have people say, can you just hand me a food plan? Can you just hand me a fitness routine? I can you won't follow it or you'll follow it for a month and then you're going to fall off because it's not your thing. It's not your excitement level. It's not what is clicking in your schedule because that's huge. And we have all these components, right? From time to energy to are we a social worker out or are we an introvert? Do we want to put in our earbuds and like, please don't talk to me. There's all these components. And unless you have somebody sitting across from you kind of hearing you, and then you can dwindle it down and go, Let's stop doing this behavior. Let's stop training for a marathon. And can we just try this Zumba class? Just see if it brings you any joy. And then if you notice getting out in a social situation at the end of a long workday is kind of the last thing you want to do, then can we try a YouTube video that you just plug, push play at your own house? Like there's just a thousand different options. And until we've exhausted them all, no one's a lost cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I like how you said that because that um, resonated with me. I've shared, I think on the podcast, but certainly in my community is, you know, exercise has been always this on off thing for me. Like I get into it, I start going good. It fits into my schedule, my schedule's rocking. And then we're a family that likes to vacation a lot. So then we go on vacation and then you come back and there's the laundry and the mail and the emails and all the to do. So like, the workouts get pushed out a week and then they get pushed out another week. And all of a sudden I'm like, wait, I've been back for three weeks and I haven't been back to the gym. Then you get all the guilt and the shame going. So like that used to happen to me a lot more than it does now. You know, we're on again, off again, on again, off again. And, you know, battling the mental drama that I would pile on top of the time away. So now I've learned that fitting in exercise, not every day on vacation, but fitting in some exercise. Now that could look different. You know, some of the places we stay, they're boutique They don't have the workout facilities there. So we just might get in more steps that day, you know, and it looks a little different. Or we might see a hill and say, okay, let's do that hill twice and climb up a hill or go hiking. And so fitting it in and while I'm doing that, saying this is my exercise, so I'm not losing the identity that I gave up on myself or I had too much bread or pasta in Italy. Like, no, I'm still taking care of myself even while on vacation. And it's not just a free for all, like a drunk fest, or I get to have all this wine or all this limoncello or whatever it is. Right. But really saying, no, I take my health with me. Mm. I don't just check it in, 
you know, never... and then come back and then I care about my health. So I really think, you know, those small changes of, okay, it doesn't have to look the same all the time. And it can morph depending on your season of life, um, if you're a family that travels a lot like ours. And, and, you know, how do you bring that with you so you're not feeling like you're doing this start-stop cycle? Yes, I love that you brought that up because I was going to say, if I was sitting across coaching you, one of my first questions would have been, could you take some movement with you on vacation? Because momentum, when flowing, you know, really helps carry us right back into real life again, too. And even if you couldn't, even if you're like one of those people who goes, vacation will never mean movement for me, which never say never. But if that's where your mindset is at the moment, then it would be, I love resiliency as I think the maybe missing puzzle piece for a lot of individuals that it's not about messing up. It's about how quickly can we recover? And that's if we went and had more drinks on vacation, if we didn't exercise on vacation, could you have, we'll use your example been super resilient and you know that when you get back from vacations exercise actually trumps laundry getting groceries in like husband now becomes part of those tasks and you actually your number one task is to get into the gym because that one time of walking through the door is probably your go button it's your thing where you all of a sudden keep going once you've been back through yeah absolutely yeah absolutely so talk about you're an accountability coach. You know, you're obviously a dietitian, author, all the things, but also you call yourself an accountability coach. Why do you see this as like a secret sauce? I'd like you to talk about that. The more I live on this earth, the more clients I get, I just don't feel like it's a lack of information for people. I really don't feel like they already don't know. Yes, there's things that we don't know, and we're forever growing and learning, you know, new tactics and new ways to approach our behaviors. But for the most part, people say, I know what to do. I just need to do it. And so it's really the accountability piece of having someone care that you're going to go show up to it. And I'll give kind of the woman who's always who's already struggling a little bit with giving time to sell. They have some barrier there. And then if working by themselves, I feel like they typically can start off gung-ho and then fall away. And then if you have somebody else who's saying, nope, this is your priority. This is staying at the top of your priority list. This is like your number one thing to do today. Then we normally go check it off the list because a lot of us are, we're shower uppers, right? We're kind of the straight A student or the like, pick me, we want to please. And so that accountability piece is just an, a gentle, nice way to to keep people on track. And so I felt like accountability, and I do believe this is like the underpinning of everything that we do. We can say that with finances. We can say it with health. We can say it with drinking. Like, But to have somebody who cares and asking is a huge deal. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the caring part. I love that so much. You know, it transforms it from feeling yucky You know, when you're doing it by yourself, I know a lot of people have the guilt and the shame. This is, you know, certainly around drinking, I'm sure around food as well. But when you work with somebody who lets you have permission to care about yourself and lets you have permission to like improve and wants you to improve just as much as you want to improve, I think that can be really beneficial and be a very um, symbiotic kind of relationship. When you're working with people and holding them accountable, what does that look like? So I do everything from one-on-one coaching to I have a membership and I have a 12-week course that I lead people through. I even have, I turned my book, Direction Not Perfection, into an audio book where they can listen and fill out journaling questions along the way. That to me is accountability as well. It's kind of like keeping somebody plugged in your ears constantly that is behooving your piece of the journey. So like, if I'm trying to drink less, guess who I'm going to have plugged in my ear every day? Dr. Price. Dr. Shared Price is going to be on my podcast list every day. So I love that about the membership aspect too, that my clients can exist within a community and then we bring in speakers and then they meet with me one-on-one. And then the course is kind of the deep dive. I feel like for the person who wants to go through the limiting beliefs and they want to do the one-on-one finding their fitness personalities and nutrition personalities, the whole thing, 
really works well when you have modules to listen to, when you have worksheets to work through, when you have one-on-one sessions to chit-chat it out. You have a community all asking and talking about the same thing. That's kind of like that all-encompassing. That was the thing I was missing when I was working at the hospital. I loved being an outpatient dietitian, but there's too much time in between sessions of, I got that patient for an hour and then they were gone for a couple of weeks. There's a lot that happens in a couple of weeks. Do you feel that way with your people? Yes, yes, exactly. When I worked outpatient and even inpatient, you know, inpatient, it's this controlled environment. I was an ICU pharmacist, right? You you needed support, right? If you're in an ICU, but then they go out and, and there's no like, I wonder how that person's doing again. So I do <laughs> love the community. Yeah. Where did they go? Yeah. Are they okay? How, how did so that sure. work out? Right. How did that work out for them? I love relationships now. I definitely love community. You know, they say when you're not connected with others, you have like social isolation and loneliness. And I think if we learned anything through, during COVID, it's that we need one another. We do better in community. I love particularly women's community because I just think we have unique needs compared to our male counterparts. I so support my husband's in a men's group and a men's community because I just think our needs can vary. And so just having that community, right, that relationship, that connection to others who are in your same journey, right? Well, we're all on different journeys at different times and having that community because if we're not intentional about that, we will just get swooped up our brain will just be bathed in all the things coming at us. It will be bathed by the news and the war and the stuff going out there. Um, mm-hmm. And that can feel jarring to our nervous system and fear producing and what's going to happen with the economy. And like, you know, if these are all your inputs, we want to be intentional and place ourselves in environments where we can tune out that noise for a bit and really bathe our brains in people, information, connection with like-minded in- individuals. And I I think you're the same, Lindsay. We want to be around healthy, healthy-minded, healthy-bodied, healthy to motion people sure. because that's where we can benefit the most and be our best selves. And so I love that you created a community and a space for that and you know, all the ways you can bathe your brain to keep it going in the direction you want it to be going, which is, you know, your podcast, right? Uh, Direction, not perfection. You're so sweet. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And doing that direction, right? Like I want my brain to be concerned about health. And coming back when I asked you about the person who's already, you know, been facing these challenges. Also, when you get to maintenance, like I want my brain to keep caring about my health. Like it doesn't, It used to feel exhaustive to me, like, oh, what am I going to do for meal plans? And I'm like thinking, when would ever this be kind of something I didn't care about? But then I asked myself, is that a question that I really want to be true? I don't want to care about what I put in my mouth. I don't want to care about how much alcohol I put in my body. Like, I always want to care. And so to me, I want to track. I want to plan. That is like... For me, a marker of success, more so than the scale. So, you know, I think it's all how we look at things, too. Um, And so I want to be constantly on a health journey. When I don't want to be on a health journey, I'm actually scared what my brain would be telling me at that point, you know? (laughs) It's not no. to eat healthy and to, you know, do the right things. Like, I, I would be concerned about a brain that doesn't think like that or doesn't want to pursue health. Yeah. So I just think it's fascinating to entertain the opposite of the question that we're asking too. Do I really not want to care about this anymore? Right. Well, and I feel like for the person who might have just listened to you and goes, I hear you, but I'm so far from that healthy, easy spot because you make it sound in a good way. Like it's not easy, but it's delightful in a sense that If you are one of those people feeling like it is all consuming and I'm overwhelmed and it all feels hard, that's just because you're at a different place than Sherry is right now. Like we all have this journey and I keep doing this spectrum thing, but you're you might be more at the starting point, you know, and it and you're where the grocery store overwhelms you. Fast forward five years and you won't be there anymore. It gets easier. It gets more fun. But we have to hang in there through some of the 
overwhelming. And that's where having coaches is such a nice thing, somebody to handhold us. So when we're panicking, they go, hang on, let's take these five simple recipes or let's take this two simple actionable steps this way. And, and then we can start to see how it could become enjoyable because I, I think a lot of my clients can be on this other end of, well, it just seems hard. It's yeah. like, to your point, yeah. even if it's hard, it's worth it. And you won't feel that way forever. It's just yeah. temporary. Thank you for mentioning that, right? I, it, you know, when you've been on the journey for a long time, it's it's hard to see it as hard as I used to, you know, because I've been mm-hmm. so along that path. But I, I know looking backwards to tag onto what you were saying, you know, it's hard staying in the unhealthy space. I think that's even harder. So like you said, once you start getting a little bit of information and implementing it, whether you can do that yourself or whether you need an accountability coach or, you know, you need somebody by your side to kind of help you get those changes and make those changes stick, it's really rewarding because then you start feeling better. Your body starts telling you stuff that like, oh, now this is the next thing or now I'm hungry for this. And it's not always going to be like donut holes and stuff like that, like I used to want to have with my morning coffee. Yeah. And, 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 and it just feels good when you're like, yeah, you can walk by some foods that used to call your name or for me, alcohol used to call my name a lot. Mm-hmm. And now it just doesn't bother me or call my name or trigger me in any form or fashion like it used to. Or you go back to it and it doesn't taste the same anymore because you're... Yes. As you change, as we transform as people, you know, and and do the different foods or or stop drinking as much. And I know you mentioned this in your podcast, like what used to be too much, now even a glass or two can be too much. And yeah. that's how I feel about food, too, is that where a donut a day for breakfast maybe feels like too much. Even just to have one on the weekend, you're like, yeah, I don't know, it just feels weird. I feel like it coated my mouth. I don't like the... I'm buzzy. I can feel the sugar buzz. It's just interesting as you experience the journey where somebody who isn't quite there yet can listen to us and be like eye rolling because they're like, they're not there yet. But that would be my, I hope you hear this listeners, you know, that you, you can be there. There, This isn't just privy to Sherry and I, like you too can be on this journey as long as you kind of settle in and just expect different results. Just Get yeah. away from that scale. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, you mentioned something, and I think I caught a wind of it. So I just wanted to, did you say nutrition or fitness personality type? Did I hear you say it? Yes. Yeah. Can you just stand upon that? <laughs> yes. So I like to call it a nutrition personality or a fitness personality because then we can self-embody that feeling mm-hmm. more so than a diet or and even diet if we really look at the word diet it really just means like what we're consuming but we we all connect it link it to diet mentality and diets true diets but if we call it a a nutrition personality then we can start to self-assess and say what do i like you know let's go like bare basics because what i notice with clients is that they go into the weeds fast. So like, should I be doing organic or should I not do organic? Should I be keto and how many carbs? Should I be doing macros or should I be doing? And it's like, hang on, how many fruits and vegetables are you eating in a day? Do you like fruits and vegetables? Let's flick. Just really breaking it down to, and then once we know what we even like, then we can take that next step and assess kind of where different macronutrients are falling. And then once we know that, it's another part of the journey, right? Like maybe 10 steps down the road, you'll care if it's organic or not, or maybe you won't. But like at this moment, that just doesn't even matter. Right now, your lowest hanging fruit is, are we getting enough fruits and vegetables in your diet? Are we getting enough protein? And I think that same way with fitness. If we think fitness personality, it needs to align with a light. You don't have to love something when you approach it, but you need to not hate it. And I have another person who always says, you know, we don't show up to brushing our teeth because we love it. We we just show up because we know it's really good for our oral hygiene. And then that's the same thing with showing up to movement. We know it's good for our brain. It actually decreases dementia. We know it's good for body movement, keeping our joints lubricated. 
It's shifting. I think that calling it a personality types, you embody it and then you make it your own. And then you can look at it differently than like what the world is telling you you should be doing. Yeah. Long-winded answer. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. Just made me think back to something that resonated so much. How you said you don't have to love something. You just need to like it. Remember yeah. when we were looking at houses and we moved into this house and put a bid on this house and got it, which was great. But we were, my husband and I were just both in like with it. We're just like, this is so much, this is so strange to spend so much money on something that you're just kind of in like with. But we liked it more than all the other houses that we were looking at. <laughs> and we were kind of like scared, like, what if we move um, in and we stop liking it, you know? But yeah. after living here, we now love our house and we love opening it up to other people and entertaining here. And we throw these massive, epic Halloween parties and I do retreats here. So it's just so interesting that you, just because you may not love it at first, you can certainly like something and then maybe grieve and grow to it, you know? Oh, that's so good. I got chills while you were talking. That's such a perfect example. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to take it out of the diet and drinking context because sometimes yes. you can see it outside of the context we're in. And when you have something like happen to you that was so like emotional and, and a lot of financial stuff on the line about that, right? It's kind of like, oh, do we just bite the bullet because we like it and not love it? And it turns out, you know, you, your opinion of things changes over time. And so very cool. I can throw out one more example. Sometimes I like same thing that you're saying, taking it outside of like using a financial example that to me, I don't love showing up to looking at finance stuff, whether that's within the business or whether it just I, I'm not great at it. My husband is finance accounting. So I think I have this like limiting belief of like I'm further down the road than I should be all this. I have like a lot of, of belief systems around that. So it's a little difficult to show up to, but when I do show up to it, how I'm supposed to, there is a piece. There is an automatic, like, no buttons get pushed on anxiety or, ah. And I had another client mention this too with, she's in a finance group, but she thinks finances are fun and she loves to show up to it. And she's seeing how other people think it's hard. And she's like, ding, ding, is that how they feel about finances, how I do about food or how somebody does about alcohol? Like, it's because of a belief system that we have in there that we yeah. need to pick apart. But but with the promise of showing up to it does provide a beneficial result, right? So it's like, how can we get ourselves to just the changes in the show up, to just show up with future self saying, thank you. Future Sherry self said, thank you for not having, you know, that extra glass of Chardonnay or future, like... I love thinking future selves because it, it looks different than when we're in the moment. 100%. Yeah. Going to the, even if you can just say, you know, one year out or some people like Stephen Covey, what did he use? Your 70th or 80th birthday? You're at your 80th mm -hmm. birthday and you look back and like, what would you want to have accomplished or how you want to have spent your time? And when, you know, you ask that, no one's going to answer saying, drink more. I wish I was drunk more. <laughs> You know, so um, that future self is so powerful. Or that I wish I wasn't able to go on a plane ride to Greece to some really cool area to go vacation or get on a roller coaster with a kid. That's what I always think about health. If you really keep asking why till you cry, especially with my population, I feel like it's moms and grandmas. They want to be active with their family. They don't want to sit on the sidelines. And it, that doesn't take being 120 pounds. That takes yeah. showing up to activity and showing up to good nutritional value, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And do your grandkids really care how much you weigh? They actually prefer you a little more comfy. Yes. This has been such a great conversation, Lindsay. Anything else that I should have asked that I didn't ask or that you want to share with the audience? Oh, that's a great question. I really feel like, thank you. This was just such a fun turning away from diet mentality conversation. And that would be the thing like if you hear nothing else today. There is this side that exists and that it doesn't mean that you gave up on yourself. It just is giving yourself enough self-love to take your journey and next step further. If you change nothing, nothing will change. I'm going to keep saying that because I think that's highly motivating that you do, in fact, have to change something if you want to see that next piece of your journey change. Yeah, I love that. And working on that step that you're willing to take next is is key. 
Well, I know of your awesome podcast called Direction Not Perfection, Mm -hmm. and I know you're an author. Tell my listeners if they want to learn more about you, how to find you. All right. My podcast is the best. Again, Direction Not Perfection. It's anywhere that you listen to them. I have a YouTube playlist if you just wanted to dive in. And here we did a Drink Less Lifestyle that Sherry kicked off for me. If you just want a PT type lesson, like they're all segmented hormones, perimenopause. And then my website is healthaccountabilitycoach.com. And that's all one word. And then you can find me at House Lifestyles on Instagram and Facebook. And I would just love to chat. I, I do return messages and emails. So it will be me, not a robot. Lindsay, you are so awesome. I so appreciate our friendship. And thank you so much mm-hmm. for coming on the podcast. You too. Thank you so much.